commander of the Army Ground Forces takes a min minute to add a few pointers to Private John Tull, Company A. Regular. is to record and preserve the history of World War II in conjunction with the Veterans Oral History Project, the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. We conduct interviews with the veterans and civilians who participated in our country's military conflicts. Today, I'm at Palm Springs Air Museum East. We have the honor and privilege of interviewing Jack K. Tull, Staff Sergeant, 125th Infantry. Welcome, Jack. Would you please spell your name and give your birth date? Okay, fine, Don. Uh, actually, if this is uh, for the record, uh, I have to go by John K. Tull. Uh, that's okay because uh, I got Jack in college and that's started uh, calling me Jack. I can do it over. But that's, no, that's fine. Uh, uh, my last name is Tull, T U L L, and my birth date was July 16, 1926, a long time ago. Where were your grandparents from? Well, let's see. I, my grandparents, uh, my father's side, uh, we're from uh, Maryland, the eastern shore of Maryland. On uh, my, uh, my mother's side, uh, I never, my grandfather on my mother's side uh, passed away when he was very young, and so I never knew him. But my grandmother was originally from Germany and, uh, and, and had come to the U.S. The, you know, a long time ago. Do you remember where in Germany? I don't remember where. Okay. No, we, you know, I, I was young. We never talked about things too much, uh, really, about that. And uh, except I know on my father's side, uh, I think they landed over here, like in uh, 1650 or something like that, from England. <clears throat> where uh, did your mother and father meet? And do you remember uh, your mother's uh, maiden name? Yeah, you know, I, 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 I can get into that a little because my father died when I was six months old. Oh. So uh, uh, the, 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 we, we lived in Hartford, Connecticut at that time, and, uh, and uh, they met uh, in the Hartford area uh, at that time. And what was the other question? Uh, well, do you, your mother's maiden name. Oh, it was Bolt, B-O-L-T-H. Do you have and brothers and sisters? Just, no, I don't have any brothers or sisters. And my mother's first name was Adele, mm -hmm. Adele both. Right. Uh, and she was a widow, uh, and uh, did she work or was she, she? She was a widow, and uh, she uh, had to go to work when my father died. He was uh, in business with his brother, and they had a company called Tow Brothers, and they were in the hardware business, uh, building hardware, hardware building, and. Uh, in Hartford, and uh, when my father died, uh, the business sort of reverted to my uncle, and she had to go to work, and uh, she actually uh, ended up, uh, she was a hairdresser, and she worked as that for a few years, and then she opened her own business, and uh, worked uh, all her life. What do you remember of your early years? Uh, can you remember anything? Uh favorite toys or things that you did uh, when you first started school or in the first school you started? I'm talking too much at you. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I, I vaguely remember. I remember going to elementary school. I remember walking a mile and a quarter each way each day. And uh, and it was a, we lived in a suburb of Hartford and it was a, it was a nice area. The school was not too large and I remember uh, Miss Strong, sixth grade. Why she was tough, but she was good. And then, uh, and then after that, uh, I went to uh, to a junior high school for two years. And then, <clears throat> then my uh, my mother sent me off to a boarding school in Massachusetts, and I was uh, at the boarding school, Wilbraham Academy, for four years. Back in those early years, did you take a lunch, and what was your favorite lunch? Oh yeah, you took a lunch, and of course it was peanut butter and jelly, and you could buy milk. I remember that. You could buy either chocolate or regular milk, 
and I thought it was a big thrill to buy the chocolate milk. Did you participate in any sports that you liked, or band, or I know you're a drummer. Yeah, no, uh, well, there were no sports in elementary school at that time, and uh, junior high school, I don't remember whether uh, whether there were sports, sports or not. But I did get into, I liked music, and I did get into, uh, uh, at, at an early age, playing the drums, because uh, in back of where we lived, was a, a man uh, that uh, played with an orchestra. He was a drummer, so he was he was nice to me, and and uh, and he showed me how to how to get started, and he gave me lessons. And finally, my mother brought me bought me a drum set, and and I played. And I played in the band at the at the boarding school, and uh, we always had groups together. It was fun. What was boarding school like? That's boarding school. Uh, was uh, was a, a mixed emotion. Uh, from an educational point of view, it was super. I mean, we had we had small classes, eight, ten, twelve in a class was about as large as they got. Very regimented, you know. They told you when to get up in the morning and what to do and when to study and when to go to classes. And but we had a lot of athletics in, in the afternoon. Uh, and it was very good from that point of view. It was, uh, it was kept me out of mischief and it also provided me a good, with a good basic ed education. Uh, the thing uh, about it on, on the other side is it was, uh, it was a bit lonely at times, you know, mm -hmm. at that age. What is that, 13 years old, I guess, and, and you're off. Uh, by yourself a good deal of the time and away from home and uh, and it was a boys school and so what I missed the probably the co-educational part of a of a high school but we had uh, we get an opportunity to meet girls we there are other girls schools around things like that so uh, but as I look back at it I, I really have to give my mother a lot of credit for pushing me in that direction it was good what were the opportunities to meet girls? What were how did you, how did that happen? Did well, you... what they would do, <clears throat> of course, they uh, you know I, I I could meet girls at home uh, when I on vacation and whatnot. But there were in New England there are a lot of boarding schools, uh, girls and boys, uh, and they were all separate in those days. But uh, they uh, they would have dances or you know social events, and the girls would come over to our school and. We get to meet them, or we go to the girls' school, something like that. Mm -hmm. Did you have any favorite subject at all in the, in in the boarding school? Well, I I don't know if it was a favorite subject, but I was looking at uh, some of my old records, and I and I had a believe it or not a scholarship uh, in Latin because I. Of, I guess I was pretty good in Latin, and I don't understand why. <laughs> and so I had a scholarship uh, in that subject. <laughs> uh, when you uh, went from border school, did you did you go right into college, or did you have another step yeah, in I went, there? I went right into college. As a matter of fact, uh, of course, in my last year of, uh, of school, in my senior year. Uh, I was 17, and uh, the war was on and been on for a couple of years, by the, well, even more than that, three years. And uh, so I knew that was ahead of me. So I took uh, an accelerated course and went to school all summer so that I could graduate. Uh, and I graduated in, Ju in January, and, and then I went on right away to college at Dartmouth, Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, and uh, and I and I don't I I'm, as I look back I wondered why I did that and how I had the the foresight to do it because it was it worked it was it was really a very good uh, good strategic move because after I got out of the service it was when I was getting out of the service I was only at Dartmouth for one one semester because uh, then I turned 18. But uh, after I get, when I was getting out of service, those who had been there before got priority in getting back in 
1946 when everybody was coming out. So I was very lucky to have, uh, have some priority so as soon as I was ready to get out of the service I could go right back into college. Why? I started over again though, the one semester. You know, I just fooled around. I knew I, I knew I wasn't going to be there long, and I couldn't concentrate. And but why did you pick Dartmouth? Well, I, 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 I I'll tell you why. I lived in in, in Hartford, the Hartford area, and uh, I applied at four colleges. I applied at Yale, Wesleyan University, which is in Connecticut, Trinity, which is in Hartford, and Dartmouth. And I had a friend of mine that went down to Yale, and I went down to visit him. Uh, to see uh, what it was like, and uh, I, uh, I was sitting in his, in his dormitory room and I saw something go by and I said, gee, what's that? And he says, that's a trolley car. And I thought, I don't want to go to a school that has trolley cars going by your dorm window. So I did the other extreme. I went up to Dartmouth and Hanover, New Hampshire, which is out in the middle of nowhere, if you've ever been there, and it's uh, absolutely beautiful. It's really country, and it's uh, it's got a campus that, that that is the epitome of what a college campus should be like, and uh, that's that's how I ended up there. Did you have a car at that time? No, I didn't have a car, and gosh, no. I used to hitchhike. Now that's something you 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 don't do or you don't see anymore, but it was uh, we were about. Gee, I think we were a hundred. Uh, a little over 100 miles, 160 miles from home. And I would hitchhike home for a weekend. You imagine that? Go down, go out of town, stand by the side of the road, put your thumb up, and people would give you a ride. And, I, and I'd hitchhike all the way to Hartford. And I, generally I took the train back because, uh, you know, I had to be sure to get back. <clears throat> but I'd hitchhike on the way down, and of course, uh, everybody gave me a ride. It was wartime. Gasoline was rationed, and people were considerate of each other and helpful. Did you have a driver's license? Uh, oh, yeah. I, I got a driver's license when I was 16. Okay. And my mother had a car. And, okay. uh, you know, what kind of a car was it? She had a Plymouth. Okay. A Plymouth, yeah. Okay. yeah. Where were you on Pearl Harbor Day? Pearl Harbor Day. Mm -hmm. I remember it well. Uh, I was in, uh, I was in, uh, at Wilbraham Academy, the boarding school, <clears throat> and it was Sunday, and we had chapel, what we call chapel service, uh, every Sunday morning. And I remember coming out of chapel service, and things were really buzzing. Boy, what was going on? And, and I learned uh, almost immediately that the Japanese had bombed. Uh, Pearl Harbor, and that's when I first heard it, and you know, just uh, really confused and and didn't understand the situation. But that's when I first heard it. Did you know where Pearl Harbor was? Well, uh, Hawaii, but I didn't even know where Hawaii was in those days. Yeah. How did you uh, get into the service? Were you drafted, or did you have any particular branches that you were looking at, like flying or yeah. sea or? No, I was drafted, okay. and uh, and I went. Uh, I'll never forget that either. Uh, I went down for the induction. This is right after I turned 18. And uh, and they said, the guy at the desk said, "Well, what do you want? The Army or the Navy?" Well, I said, "I'd really like the Navy." And he picked up the Army stamp and he whacked Army on it. And I thought, "You son of a gun, you!" <laughs> So I, I ended up in the Army, and then I went to, uh, so immediately we were sent up to Fort Devens in Massachusetts uh, for processing, you know, they give you the, uh, the, the, the uniform and all the equipment. Did and, you go by train? Uh, going up there, yes, I think it was by train. Uh, the thing, thing that uh, amazed me is uh, that I remember the PX, of course, everybody smoked in those days, and they had Camels, Lucky Strikes, Chesterfield cigarettes. And I remember, I think they were 15 cents a pack or something like that, you know, really a bargain price. And of course, I started smoking. And uh, anyway, we were there four, five, six days, 
And then if you want me to continue on. Uh, Absolutely. We, we were there four or five, six days, and then they said, okay, uh, we're moving out. They, we, they had pulled the train up. We got on a train. We didn't know where we were going, except we knew we were going south because it kept getting warmer. <laughs> we, we went through uh, Philadelphia and, and Washington, D.C., and Richmond, Virginia, and so we were headed south. And uh, we were on it for a couple of days. Didn't move too fast. We got down and stopped, and we got off the train in a, a kind of a rural area. And uh, they said, okay, everybody line up, go this way. And they looked up a bit at a big sign, and it said, uh, Camp Wheeler, Georgia, IRTC. And they said, what the devil is IRTC? And someone said, that is Infantry Training Replacement Center. And my heart sunk right down to my feet at that point. I was in the infantry in Camp Wheeler, Georgia. And what kind of training did you go through? Uh, I, basic infantry training. Uh, the program, I think, in the eighth week. But it had an interesting incident take place. In the eighth week, somehow I got scarlet fever. I got sick as can be. And I got scarlet fever, and they put me in the uh, infirmary, they called it at that time. And uh, they got all excited, because I think I was the only soldier in the, in the whole camp that had scarlet fever. And of course, that's a very contagious disease. And so I was in there uh, for several weeks. Uh, the, the strongest drug they had was a sulfa drug at the time. They didn't have penicillin and whatnot. And uh, so I, I lost out. My, uh, my unit finished their training, and uh, when I got out, I had to join up with a unit that was in the stage uh, where, where I was when I got sick. Uh, but I was kind of fortunate in a way, because uh, my unit uh, got a furlough. I think they got two weeks off and then shipped out. And they went over to Europe right away, and they put, immediately went into the Battle of the Bulge. So uh, I missed the Battle of the Bulge, uh, uh, and, uh, which was probably the biggest uh, battle in Europe for the whole war. And, uh, and uh, so when I finished my training, uh, Congress had passed a law at that time, right at that moment, that you couldn't send an 18-year-old into combat. And I was 18 years old, of course. And uh, that really, uh, that really stunned the army, because they, the you couldn't send them into combat unless they had advanced training, was the law. The army did not have an advanced training program uh, for for the infantry or or any anyone in the army. And they didn't know they didn't know what to do with us. They really didn't know what to do. So uh, I I spent a. Uh, Several uh, several weeks uh, at Fort Meade in Maryland, guarding German prisoners, and, and uh, 18 years old, and uh, you know I used to have to walk them to the to the hospital when they wanted to go here and there. I'll never forget. And I said to them, "Well, you know, you have a rifle and an M1." They said, "Well, what if they did? What I do if?" You know, if they decide to try and run and escape, they'd pick it up and shoot them. That was my first uh, real experience as to how serious things were. What were the Germans like? What was your impression yeah. of them as an 18-year-old and they what were, they looked like? They were nice. They were good-looking guys, young guys like myself. And uh, and actually, uh, uh, you know, they, they were, really were non-violent or anything like that. They were cooperative. I think they were happy to be in the U.S. to tell you in a prison camp. They were well fed and everything. But it's a funny feeling. It's like a jail. You know, you'd walk in and the door would clink behind you and it's a funny feeling to be behind bars. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but they, you know, they didn't want the war any more than we did. Mm -hmm. To go back to your basic training, what kind of uh, 
armament were you trained to use? What You mentioned the M1 and... Well, yeah, the M1 was a standard rifle in those days, and uh, we had a carbine, which is a smaller version of a rifle. And uh, uh, we had uh, uh, hand grenades. Uh, I'll, I'll never forget hand grenades. Uh, uh, I, they made me a squad leader right away. <coughs> and uh, so I was, one of the things I was supposed to do was to uh, to be an instructor, or an assistant instructor in hand grenades. And so you'd go into a trench and they'd hand you a hand grenade and you know, you pull the pin and let her go. And uh, I'll never, and it's a nervous feeling because, uh, you know, until you're used to it, you think, well, as soon as I pull that pin, that thing is going to explode. So some of the guys come through, they're all different, and uh, some of them are shaking and nervous. And this one guy uh, that I'm standing by to instruct, uh, he pulls the pin and drops the hand grenade. <laughs> well, that woke me up real fast. And I reached down and I picked that thing up and heaved it. Fortunately, before it went off, but that was a uh, that was part of the training. Uh, I know we uh, gas mask drill was was kind of a kind of an experience too, and uh, they'd uh, put you in a in a room, and uh, then they'd start injecting some obnoxious gas of some kind, and you had a, a limited amount of time to take that gas mask out and put it on, and and uh, be sure you. You did it fast enough, and again, you know, all those things uh, you wanted to really perfect uh, real fast. Can you tell us a little more about what happens when you pull the pin in a hand grenade? Yeah. And how many seconds you have to okay. get rid of it? Well, the, the, the hand grenade has a handle on it, uh, and you grasp the hand grenade and hold on to the handle at the same time, and then you pull the pin. And nothing happens at that moment. But as soon as you throw it, the handle releases, and there's a spring under the handle. And the spring comes down, and it hits, hits a, a detonator. And it takes several seconds for it to, to detonate down into the chamber of the hand grenade, which is full of powder, gunpowder. And that's how it works. I'll be done. Yeah. So you were a squad leader, and uh, you were at uh, guarding prisoners, German prisoners, and what came next? Okay, next, finally, after uh, about a month or six weeks, the Army uh, got into action to establish some advanced training. So I was shipped out to uh, Alabama, Camp Rucker, Alabama, which is now Fort Rucker. And um, the, the, that was, at this point, advanced training, but, you know, they really didn't have a thing very set up too well. So at that point, uh, they recommended me for officers' training school. And so I was sort of less helping the officers there and, and uh, passing time, and we were doing some training. and. Uh, and they, it was very nice, a good group of guys, and, and uh, I associated mostly with the officers. And uh, it, it was fine. Everything was going fine. I was just waiting to go off to, to OCS. And, uh, and so all of a sudden we got a call, uh, hey, by tomorrow night we're, the whole camp is moving out and we're we got a, a, a train uh, that we had to get on, and and so uh, we had to pack up and get everything ready, and it was a, it was really a, a hasty situation. I got on this train, and of course now we're heading west. And uh, after a couple of days, three days, I guess it was, tr uh, troop trains didn't go too fast. They uh, they didn't have much priority over the freight trains, even hardly. But anyway, <clears throat> ended up in uh, Fort Ord in California, and spent a few days there. And then we got shipped down to to the Los Angeles area, and before I knew it, uh, I was looking at a ship, and uh, and uh, sure enough, uh, <laughs> that was that was my transportation. So it was uh, 
San Pedro is the harbor in the Los Angeles area. So uh, before I knew it, we were on the ship, uh, the William P. Biddle, which is a troop ship. And uh, the thing is pulling away from the dock. And in my humorous experience, they're playing a sentimental journey, a big band down there playing sentimental journey as they're pulling. Oh, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> and so uh, we were on this, uh, on this ship, and we didn't know where we were going. We just knew it was the Pacific Ocean. And by that time, the war in, in Europe uh, was essentially over. And so uh, w there was a lot of transferring of troops to the Pacific. And uh, we were on, uh, so anyway, the kind of an interesting thing about the ship was a troop ship, and I, I went down to where my bunk was, and you go way down on this, on these steps, and the, it, and I looked, and I think, I can't remember where they were, five or six high on the bunk, and I was the second tier, and so when time, time came to go to bed, uh, I, I slept there, and, and I, it, it was a bad night. I hardly got any sleep, because every time I rolled over, my hip would hit the, the guy above me. The, the space was so limited. And it began to be uh, uh, kind of warm, hot, and, uh, and uh, not pleasant. So I, I was <clears throat> on the deck the next morning, and they uh, talking to some guys, and they were talking about, oh, this is horrible, geez, I can't sleep down there. So this other fellow and I, Dan Lonis, who was from Massachusetts, uh, decided uh, we are going to sleep up. We weren't going to go down there to sleep. So we ended up, and the, they had these hatches on the ship, and they were covered with like a canvas. And we ended up uh, sleeping on the hatch. Uh, we were on the ship for 22 days, and uh, I slept down there just one night. Uh, the food was good. The Navy had good food. Uh, uh, taking a shower in salt water is not necessarily a clean feeling. Uh, so, we, you know, they didn't bother us. We just had to entertain ourselves uh, all day long, and you could roam around and do what you want. Uh, so we, we, we would play cards, a game called Hearts was very popular in those days, and we, we had a lot of these uh, landing craft on it, and some of them were over the side and some were just inside the railing, and we'd sit under, you know, you needed some shade, so we'd sit under a landing craft and a bunch of us would play uh, cards, and uh, somebody had a copy of Forever Amber, which was a really the, <laughs> the book that was <laughs> very popular in those times. So play cards and read Forever and Ember and uh, wild away the time. Was the passage rough? Were there any big storms you went no, through? No, okay. it was very smooth as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. and, uh, it, would, they, it was interesting to, to watch uh, some of the birds out there. You wonder how they got out that far. and, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a an inter I had an interesting experience. Finally, uh, we decided, you know, you, you're you're with people all the time. There's no such thing as privacy or whatnot. So Dan and I decided what we we're going to do is uh, one of the Higgins boats was hanging over the side. They had a bunch of them, and uh, we decided we're going to go up and sleep in that thing tonight. And so uh, when it got dark. Uh, we uh, <clears throat> we stepped across. Now the, the the space between the the ship and the Higgins boat, it, it looked to me like it was three feet, but I bet it wasn't more than 18 inches or two feet at the most. But you had to kind of step from the ship into up into the Higgins boat, and we thought this is going to be great. This is our private suite for the night. We got up there, and we discovered that the thing was vibrating. It was vibrating something terrible from the ship. I, I don't know the connection, or and you couldn't even you couldn't sleep. You couldn't even think about it. And then it came time to we decided this is a dumb idea, <laughs> and we uh, we uh, went back, uh, decided to go back onto the ship. Well, at that point, I looked over and I looked down. It was dark, and I thought that space was 
four foot wide at that point. I just, uh, I thought, boy, am I going to get across this thing or not? But I had to get back. <laughs> uh, but it wasn't, it, you know, I made it fine, but uh, it was scary. It really was scary. Got back on the ship, we were happy to sleep on the deck again, which is pretty hard. Uh, you mentioned the food. What what did you eat, or what did you have to eat? Well, the Navy has good food, uh, and uh, there, there's another interesting situation. You kind of adapt yourself to your environment at the time. So they, the Navy would blow those funny whistles they blow, and that would mean it's time to, to line up for mess. And uh, we'd be playing cards, and we, you know, we wouldn't hurry. And by the time we got ready to go. The line would be ha almost halfway around the ship. You know, Dan and I thought, this is, this is standing in line like this to eat. <laughs> so we saw, he would get up there and we saw a big guy standing by the door. He his arms are crossed and he was a, a big rugged looking guy. So we decided we got to get to know that big rugged looking guy, which we did. Uh, and his name, it was Jay Markle. He was from Illinois. And uh, we got to know him. And so uh, then uh, the deal was, well, we just play cards. When we finished like playing cards, uh, we saunter up to the door, passing the line, and we get up there. And Jay would say, come on in. And so we go to the head of the line. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't cause any riots or anybody. Uh, no riots. Uh, he was big enough. He was big enough, and yeah. he was a good guy. And the food, I, you know, gee, I think we even had steak one day or something like that, which we never had in the Army. But it was good and it was hot, and, and that, that part of it was, uh, was very pleasant. But we were on the ship for 22 days. We finally, the rumor spread around we were going to Mindanao in the Philippines. And... Uh, we got uh, uh, we got near there, and then the word was we're going into Luzon, which is the big island where Manila is. And so we went right into the harbor of Luzon, and uh, and then then another experience. Uh, we had to uh, go over the side of the ship. They had netting down the side of the ship. They lowered the Higgins boats. And then they had netting on the side of the ship, and you had to go over the side of the ship and climb down on the netting to the Higgins boat. And that, that looked like six stories down when you looked down. And the thing is bobbing around and everything. <coughs> so uh, that was another experience that, uh, I, you know, I, I was determined I'm, I'm not going to slip. Like, I'm making it down that Higgins boat. And uh, we did. Went in on the Higgins boat. But anyway, uh, at that point, uh, uh, what, what we found out at that point uh, was that we were there to stage the invasion of Japan. And uh, the, f the fortunate thing that happened again, you know, I missed the Battle of the Bulge, so I was lucky to do that. But anyway, while we were on the ship going over there. President Truman gave the order to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And uh, that ended the war real fast. So once again, I was uh, I lucked out because of the invasion of Japan would have been uh, an unprecedented slaughter, really, to go into Japan. We would have, it would have been really bad. So, so I spent a year, a little over a year, in in the Manila, in the in the area, uh, and uh, had various assignments there. Uh, I want to go back to going over this <coughs> side. What were you carrying? Didn't you have your complete? Well, I had. We all we all we always had our backpacks, you know, mm -hmm. full of full of stuff, uh, but in addition to that, we had a duffel bag. We didn't have to, we didn't have to go over the side with a duffel bag, as I recall. Uh, and I, so the backpack was really the, the only weight that we carried going down. I, no, we didn't have to go over with, 
I think they took those in separately because they were big and bulky. Okay. And uh, so that wasn't too bad. It was just the, the height of, uh, uh, and the anxiety of s slipping her. Now, what what were your assignment? You had some different duties for a year. Yeah, okay. right. I, I, I there again, the the war just ended, and we guarded Japanese prison prisoners for a while, and they they didn't know quite what to do with, with us either when we got there, and so uh, I was in a thing called the Fifth Camp Battalion, which really. Uh, it really was just a place for us to sleep and live for a while until they found out where where to assign us. So I got assigned uh, first to a no first I got assigned to the Manila Leave Center, and what that was is uh, they, it was it was really a recreational area for the troops. They were bringing the troops in from various parts of the Pacific who had been in combat and battle and, and hadn't had a, any time off for a while. And they'd bring them in there <clears throat> and uh, they could spend a week or 10 days. And uh, we had entertainment, USO entertainment for them. The food was good and, uh, and sports and recreation and things like that. It was, it was sort of a vacation for these guys. and. Uh, we also had a, a place up in Baguio in the, uh, in the Philippines, which was up in the north, where it was cooler up in the mountains and whatnot, and we'd send some of them up there for a while. And uh, I was in the headquarters battalion. Uh, I didn't get involved in the entertainment thing. We just, we're just operating the camp. And, uh, and uh, that's where I, I spent a good deal of time uh, that's where I started getting my promotions, and I ended up uh, being the sergeant major of the battalion, although I was only a staff sergeant. Uh, and then uh, there was one other experience I had before that, though. Uh, we, we, uh, the word went out that they were wanted to form a football team in the Philippines because uh, the, the, they started forming these teams and. Uh, and they had some in Japan and Okinawa and whatnot. So uh, Jay Markle, our friend from the ship, and Dan and I, we all ended up in the same place. And this, <clears throat> so we put in a, we applied to go uh, to play football. And so we went up to Clark Air Force Bases where they were, where they were holding the camp and the practice and training and everything like that. And I, at that point, I had a good job. I, I was in a motor pool, and uh, it, it was uh, really a soft experience. And I had a jeep and everything, and all that. And it was, life was pretty good. And uh, so my uh, my captain uh, really got ticked off after a while because I went away up to play football, which was another experience. You know, that was nice. We had to. The, the Red Cross gals and whatnot around. That was fun. Clark Air Force. The Air Force lived well, too, you know. And so uh, the captain sent word up, hey, you come back or I'm going to transfer you to, <laughs> to some place where you won't want to be. So I went back, and then somehow I'd forgotten. I got, ended up in the Manila Leaf Center, and that was right, right down in the heart of Manila. And... Uh, can you go back and give us a comparison of guarding German prisoners as versus Japanese prisoner? Yeah, I'll give you a... And, yeah. and what kind of people were the Japanese? Um, and unfortunately, uh, uh, I had a bad attitude with the Japanese. Uh, the Germans, it was a little different. Uh, I was pretty green then. And, but, uh, you know, after going all, through all the training, uh, and what does the training uh, teach you? It teaches you to kill the enemy. That's the that's the whole objective. And uh, the uh, we really hated the Japs. We call them Japs. Uh, their atrocities uh, were so bad. The way they treated people, and we knew about it and whatnot. And it, it was unfortunate because these guys were 
probably didn't want to go to war any more than we did. But uh, we didn't take any anything from them, I'll tell you. Uh, we treated them pretty rough. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, when your ship went into the Bay of Luzon, is that what? Yeah. Yeah. What was it like? Were there ships all over? Manila or? Bay. Manila Bay? Can uh, yeah. It, 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 it was, uh, that was where one of the worst battles of the war had been fought there, mm -hmm. and there were sunken ships all around. I mean, uh, the whole harbor was full of uh, uh, sunken ships, and, and so we had to kind of wiggle our way in. They'd cleared a path, and, uh, you, you know, that, they had some bad, bad battles there while I, while I was there. I had a chance to get out of uh, Corregidor, and Bataan, you know, I think probably they don't even teach the yet present generation what happened at Bataan and the march of, uh, of our soldiers from Bataan and Corregidor, uh, and how bad it was, and the way they were treated by the Japanese, and that was, uh, you know, a big factor in the way, in our attitude towards the Japanese uh, that we had there. Uh, but. Uh, Manila, the Philippines were nice people. Uh, it, uh, Manila was the second most destroyed city in the in the world, next to uh, some some city in Czechoslovakia. I think it was worse or something like that. It was really really leveled, uh, but uh, we started rebuilding it. And, and it, it, it as I say, there were nice people. What did you do for recreation? Did you have R and R, or did you have any? Well, we were we were at R and R ourselves. So, uh, okay. but but the, they they started establishing recreation and sports right away, and so they formed a baseball team there, and they were called the Manila Dodgers, made up of uh, servicemen, and uh, gee, they had uh, some uh, some real professional ball players that. Uh, that were on the team, and we had we could go to baseball games, and and of course uh, the usual movies and things like that, and a lot of the USO brought a lot of people in. Can you remember any of the USO people? Like was Bob Hope there? Did you ever see him? Or no, Bob Hope wasn't there. I, uh, I, re I remember a baseball player. Uh, his name was Early Wynn. Sure. Uh, Early Wynn turned out to be a, a great pitcher. Played for the Chicago White Sox for a number of years, and he was on the team in Manila, Manila Dodgers. Uh, we had uh, we had uh, clinics that we brought uh, the uh, coaches and people like that that, uh, that, that uh, came in. Uh, an interesting thing is that uh, we had I applied to Trinity College in Hartford. And while I was there, uh, the basketball coach and the football coach came in to, to hold clinics. And the basketball coach was, his name was Ray Oosting, he was from Hartford. So naturally, I made a point of introducing myself to the, the two of them and, uh, and while they were in the Philippines, in Manila. Well, as it turned out later, it's a, it's a coincidences are, are interesting. Uh, my roommate in college uh, married Donna Oosting, uh, which was Ray's daughter. And so, uh, you know, it was funny that I met her father over in Manila uh, at that time. When, of course, we naturally had become great friends and still are uh, friends. But uh, there we were, thousands of miles away. Thousand miles away, did you have pen pals or? Any sweethearts or uh, correspondence uh, while you're in the service, or I had some, I, I had some, uh, uh, not too much. Mm. Uh, I can't remember sticking with a girl long enough to. Kathy, you like one? <laughs> Sorry. I to uh, have, have have much in the way of pen pals at that point. And all all those years. Uh, you mentioned, was there some combat activity around you when you... Oh yeah, you know, when I got there... What was going on? They were still up in the hills, the Japanese, 
And of course, they, they wouldn't accept the fact that the war was over. And so you had to be real careful at that point because we were flushing them out. Uh, out of the hills, they were in caves. I mean, you, 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 it, you remember some of the stories that one, two years later, they were discovering these Japanese uh, in the remote areas. And so uh, that was going on, but of course, uh, you know, nothing very heavy, just sporadic shooting you'd hear once in a while. And uh, when did you return, and was that tied in with discharge? And uh... Yeah, it was uh, 1946, after I'd been there a year. Uh, it was interesting. Uh, at that point, the, a lot of people were returning to the U.S., so they, uh, they offered me w what was called a battlefield commission. It wasn't really a battlefield at that time, but they offered me a an immediate commission. I wouldn't have to go to officer school or anything if I would sign up for two years and stay mm -hmm. stay on. And I, I said, no, I'm not interested. You can make me a colonel. I wouldn't stay. I just wanted to get out and get home. So it was, uh, in the meantime, uh, I received notice from Dartmouth uh, asking my intentions about uh, the class uh, starting in the fall of 1946. So I, I, uh, I applied affirmatively, I'll be there, hold the space for me. And, uh, and I was just sort of uh, taking a chance and trying to figure it out because I wasn't sure when I was going to get out. Uh, and, the, and I was still, I finally received notice that they were going to ship me back. And it was September 4th and I was still in Manila. And the classes at Dartmouth were starting on the 19th. <laughs> and that's, <laughs> I knew I had a problem. Yeah. But anyway, you know, uh, in the service you get to know your contemporaries and various other outfits and branches and whatnot, and I got to know uh, my equivalent uh, over in the Air Force, uh, Army, it was called the Army Air Corps in those days, it wasn't the Air Force, and who uh, <clears throat> had something to do with who flew and who didn't fly. I was scheduled to go on a ship. I was already booked for that. I, 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 uh, I got lucky again, and my friend uh, put me on a list and uh, to fly home. So that was really great, I'll tell you. And uh, we, uh, I spent a few days there, and and then uh, we ended up in Guam on the first leg, and I got, I got bumped off the plane because I didn't have much priority, and I thought, oh boy. Here I am in Guam now, but it, it only lasted a couple of days. And I was on a plane again, and I returned home. We stopped at Johnston Island and Kwajalein, and and, and finally into um, Honolulu. And those other places were just for refueling, and we uh, we got into Honolulu real early in the morning, and we were scheduled to leave late in the afternoon. And a fellow I was traveling with had an uncle there or something. He came over and picked us up and took us on a tour of, of uh, Honolulu in the area. And it was just great, great feeling. You coming home, I had my first glass of milk in over a year, and that was great. Uh, so we took off and, and uh, we were headed for the, for the U.S. Because uh, Hawaii was not, not a state in those days. And uh, we were flying through the night, and I woke up in the morning, and I looked out the plane, and it was a four-engine plane, not a jet, and the, the propeller on uh, one engine was stopped. And I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> we're, we're not operating on four engines. Uh, and they didn't even tell us, uh, you know, what had happened. So. It was uneventful, and we soon, at daylight, we came in and we were flying right over the Golden Gate Bridge. And I'll tell you, that's one of the greatest thrills I've ever had in my life, was to see that Golden Gate Bridge. And we went into an airport up near Sac Sacramento, Fairfield, Suzanne at that time, and landed there and, and uh, touched, touched the 
the homeland again. It was, it was really exciting. And then uh, you went to Dartmouth. Yeah, then they yeah. put me on a troop train again. And uh, you made the date, the starting date? I made it. Oh, I made it. I went to Fort Meade and uh, to be, uh, no, Fort Dix in New Jersey for discharge. And uh, they, they, you know, they, they knew we wanted, didn't want to hang around there long, so we just got in there and they processed and got us right out real fast. And I made the date by about three days Boy. to get to be there for registration. Lots of lots of interesting memories. Well, now let's go into life after service. You uh, did you specialize in Dartmouth? What was your curriculum and what were the well, I, courses yeah. you liked best? Uh, I, I majored in economics and uh, got out in the in June of 1950 I graduated. I started all over in 46 when I got back uh, because I, I felt that I'd forgotten the little I'd learned from one semester I was there. And uh, major in economics, it was a great experience like, uh, like a lot of uh, people. I, I, my only regret was as I looked back and got more mature is that I really didn't take advantage of all the opportunities that were there. There was just so much you could do. Well, you had some social activities. Well, and, a lot uh, of social activities. Yeah. yeah, a lot of social. Longer fraternity. What was the fraternity? Chi Phi. Okay. Yeah, it was a good group of guys. Very enjoyable. Do you still have friends from that group? Oh, yes. Some of my best friends are from that group. Yeah. Uh, my roommate, uh, we're still in close contact with him, and a couple other friends. I just, we just went to, uh, 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 we've been on several vacations together, uh, and uh, I met Phyllis there too. My oh, wife. Oh, tell me about meeting Phyllis. Oh, okay, that's that's another story. That's an important story. It's a very important story. I, I had a fraternity brother. Bob Jackson, uh, who uh, when, when they came down, we, at the fraternity house, we lived up on the second floor, and we had a bedroom and a study room, and, and I, I was in the, in the study room, and he came, he was coming down, I could hear him coming down the corridor, and he was saying, uh, he said, I, I, I've got a, uh, my girlfriend is a, a flight attendant, they call them stewardesses in those days, okay. with the United Airlines at, in New York. And he said, I'm having her come up for a football weekend, I don't know, the week after next or the week after that. And, uh, you know, she doesn't want to come alone. She wants to bring another stewardess with her. And uh, so does any, you want, anybody want a date? And I can hear him, you know, the next room. <laughs> uh, and the, the two guys in the next room both had girlfriends, and so uh, he came to my room and uh, said, same thing, are you interested in a date with a United stewardess uh, for the football game? And I, I already had a date. And I said, oh, no, thanks, Deke. Bob Jackson, I call him Deke. And so he was going to the next room, and I thought, hey, I just did a stupid thing. I said, the flight attendant with United Airlines, and in those days, uh, they were highly, uh, highly, uh, how shall I say? Uh, uh, admired. Admired. And, uh, and uh, you know, it, 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 you couldn't go wrong. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I said, hey, Dick. Come on back. I said, listen, I'd like to have the date with this flight the stewardess. And so I canceled my, the date I had. Some gave her some lame excuse. And uh, sure enough, two weeks later, and on a Saturday, no, let's see. She, she came up on Friday, Friday. And it, to what, she took the train up. Uh, from, and they came in a White River Junction, Vermont, which is the, the railroad town not far above, five or six miles from Hanover. And uh, 
Trini came in, met her, and uh, what was your first impression? Boy. <laughs> My first impression is you didn't make a mistake by <laughs> Great. agreeing to this. And we had a, a marvelous time. And I... Do you remember what she wore or anything? Uh, uh, well... She was beautiful. <laughs> okay, good. And I fell in love right away. Atta boy. And so uh, did you ask for another date right away? Oh, sure. <laughs> but she was in New York, and I was way up there, and it was 260 miles away. <clears throat> but, uh, but we did, we did start dating, and I started going down to New York to see her down there, and uh, it, it just, uh, it, it, it just uh, was a wonderful thing, and I was so fortunate to meet Phyllis at that time. When did you propose? Well, let's see, uh, we met in the fall of 49, I graduated in June of 50, and uh, we were married in February of 51, and I can't remember the exact time I, I proposed, I think it was, uh, it was sometime uh, in the summer of, of, of 50. Okay. Yeah. And what was Phyllis' maiden name, and where was she from? Uh, her maiden name was Phyllis Weeks, and she was from Joliet, Illinois. Oh my gosh! That's yeah, right. that ties in with Oakville. And she uh, she flew out of LaGuardia Airport and lived in uh, Astoria, Long Island, and uh, and yeah. I had a friend, a fraternity brother, who lived in Bronxville, New York. And uh, I used to we we used to go down and stay at his house uh, on weekends, and then I could go over and Phyllis was over in the story not too far away, and pick her up, and we'd we'd all go out together in New York City, and we loved uh, we loved jazz. We'd go down to Greenwich Village, and go to some of the real great jazz clubs down there. You remember the name of any of them, or one that you liked, or? Yeah, you know, boy, I, re I could bring up the name in about uh, a few oh, yeah. seconds, but uh, I'll work on that. Oh, well, one of them was Eddie Condon's. Oh, Eddie yeah. Condon was a guitar player and had a great band, played Dixieland. Oh. Yeah, and uh, so that was one of the places we went to. We had another interesting experience uh, at the time. Uh, Let's see, uh, I was going to pick up Phyllis in Astoria, and we, it was in Bronxville, and my fraternity brother, he was going to pick up a gal someplace around there, and we were going to meet in Manhattan and have a night out. And we were going to meet at the, uh, what, the Stork Club, uh, which was a, a very famous nightclub in New York at that time. A guy by the name of Sherman Billingsley ran it. Yeah. and. Uh, so we were, we got there early, and you know, how old am I then? I'm about 20, 23, 22, 23. And uh, we're, we're, they usher us to a booth, and uh, we're, we're just uh, ordering a drink, and, uh, and uh, some the waiter walks over with a telephone. <laughs> And he plugs it in uh, to an outlet and where we were sitting, and he said, you have a telephone call. I said, I have a telephone call. <laughs> <laughs> and it was my, my fraternity brother. He was running late. And so he called up just to tell me he's running late. He'd be there. And, uh, and I thought, wow. <laughs> At the <Stork laughs> this, is, yeah. this is getting a telephone call at the, the Stork Club. It was yeah. uh, like, like the movies. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway. Uh, at the next table to us, not far away, uh, was Judy Garland. She was there with, I don't know, a husband or a friend or something. And Judy Garland was a very famous... Okay. Judy Garland. Yeah, yeah, Judy Garland was a big, big star at the time. She was a tremendous singer 
and, uh, and a, a big star on Broadway. And uh, she had a troubled life and, and lots of problems. But uh, it was very interesting to, to first time I'd ever been that close to a celebrity, so to speak. And, uh, <clears throat> but the thing about it, I don't know, what the phone call must have, uh, must have prompted something because uh, soon uh, Sherman, Sherman Billingsley shows up and he's the owner and he gives Phyllis a bottle of, uh, of a perfume and uh, he gave me a, a pair of red suspenders that said Stork Club oh, on them. I still have it. Oh, and so uh, here we were, two kids, uh, in the in the in the most famous nightclub in New York at the time, uh, being treated like that. And so <laughs> it was a kick. It really was. Yeah. Speaking of kids, when you got married, now, how about your family? How many children and grandchildren? Uh -huh. Well, we got married, and uh, as I say, in February '51. And I, after I got out of college, I, I was uh, with an investment firm in Hartford, Connecticut called Cooley & Company. They were members of the New York Stock Exchange, and I was essentially a stockbroker for a while. And uh, <clears throat> I soon realized that uh, in order to uh, stay in that business, Hartford wasn't the city to be in the, in the securities business. New York was the place to go. Uh, but I really didn't care for New York. I just had spent a lot of time in New York, and I, I, I sort of made the decision, I really don't want to work in New York and live near it. And uh, so at that time, uh, 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 Phyllis, of course, we were married, and uh, we would come back to Joliet in Chicago. Uh, and I, I, I really liked Chicago when I came out here. And so uh, I, we made the decision <clears throat> uh, to move to Chicago rather than New York, and, and I would go in the investment business in Chicago. So I had some uh, made, had made some inquiries and connections and whatnot, and I had a couple of offers uh, in Chicago to, in the investment business. Uh, and, and so we moved out. And uh, I decided to take a little time off before doing it. But I've, I always w was interested in the banking business. And, uh, and in Hartford, I, I made a stab at it. And, and from, a, from a banker I knew, and he discouraged me from doing it. So that's why I went in the investment business. So I thought, well, while I'm in Chicago, uh, I'll just go around pop in a couple of banks and just see what's going on there. And uh, so I did. I went to, to the Northern Trust Company. I went to, uh, to the First National Bank of Chicago and uh, also uh, the Harris Bank. And uh, all three of them offered me a job. And uh, <clears throat> the the so I, but I, I, it got down to between the Northern Trust and the, and the First National, and actually the, the, the Northern offered me a little more money than the First National did. The First National offer was thirty-seven hundred and eighty dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you imagine that? I can. It's very close to Thirty-seven hundred and eighty dollars. Gosh. Uh, but I liked I liked the atmosphere at the First National. I liked the people uh, there, and I felt that the, you know, it's sort of my kind of people. Whereas uh, I, the Northern Trust, I felt was a little stuffy, and a little North Shore, as we call it, a lot of North Shore, Lake Forest, as uh, we call it in Chicago. And so I took the job at the First National, and uh, and that, that I won't uh, dwell on that. I'll just. Uh, uh, hit, hit that. I stayed there. I was there. I had lots of uh, various functions at the bank and uh, stayed there for 19 years. But getting back to getting married, you know, we, uh, we moved to, to Chicago and we lived in LaGrange. And that's where I met Don Ahrens, who I'm sitting with today. Can you imagine that? That was in 19. 
53. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's 55, actually. It, you, we moved there in 53, and I think I met you yeah. <coughs> in, after two or three years we were there. And, uh, and uh, we were in LaGrange uh, on uh, S S Sixth Avenue, I think it was, two or three blocks away from the railroad station. It was a great location. Uh, I could commute into Chicago on the Burlington Railroad. It was real fast. It was great. Uh, and while we were in LaGrange, uh, uh, our son Jim was born, our eldest, and uh, without getting into a lot of detail, but to talk about family, uh, it, we ended up having uh, three children, Jim and two girls, Nancy and Carolyn. I'm going to take a little drink oh, here. Oh, yeah. Excuse me. So, uh, soon after that, we, we in 1956, we bought our first house in Naperville, Illinois, and lived there, and spent a lot of time with Don and Marty, and <coughs> had a lot of fun. Jack and Renee. <coughs> Jack and Renee Cooper, yeah. and we're still friends. 1955, that's a long time. That's great. It sure is. You know, uh, and then how many grandchildren do you have today? <coughs> we have five grandchildren, all girls. Oh, I we love yeah. them all. Yeah. Girls are neat. And uh, Nancy has three girls, and uh, they live in, in Evergreen, Colorado. We, in fact, we were out there last week, and uh, they're all growing up. Uh, Stephanie, the oldest, is applying at colleges now, and... Annie is, is the middle girl, and Carrie's the youngest. And uh, Jim is, uh, our son Jim lives in Tiburon, California, uh, in the San Francisco area. And he has, uh, he has two twin daughters, who are Emily and Jane, who are seven years old now. And uh, his wife is Meredith, who is a California gal. And uh, Nancy married Scott Latimer, who was a neighbor of ours in Barrington, and they went yeah. to high school together. Yeah. Carolyn, of course, is uh, is uh, married to Charlie Martin, and they live in Geneva. They don't have any children, and we see them often. Uh, Jack, can you relate to anything you learned in World War II service that benefited you in your career as a banker, and now you're into real estate and doing lots of things and buying companies. But did any of that service stick or anything that you learned there? Like hunting, do you, do you hunt? Because uh, you, I, you had an expert rifleman. Yeah, I don't hunt. I, okay. I, I was the best shot in our battalion. Oh. And I, I, was, uh, I got an expert rifleman medal. Uh, and uh, but I don't hunt. I never had any interest in hunting. Uh, but I, I, the army, I learned. Uh, I grew up fast in the army. Uh, you learned a lot of things. You had to get along with with people, and uh, the the mixture of people uh, ran the gauntlet uh, all the, all the way from guys uh, that never went to high school to other people and, and you got along with these people you relied on each other and uh, I, I learned that uh, to be conscientious and and you had an opportunity for promotion and work hard and, and it, it was a, it really was a good experience you know you, you really matured kind of fast and uh, you know I I don't think there's anything wrong with Young men spending a year or two in the army or in the service, and they get uh, you get a different perspective than I think what a lot of them have today. What would you tell your grandchildren, and maybe this tape will be their children, that you'd like them to remember about World War II in our country? <clears throat> I don't think. Uh, <laughs> I don't think. Uh, the succeeding generations uh, really understand what World War II was all about. 
and what our participation was. And uh, it, it's kind of unfortunate. I guess they don't teach it much, and probably it's just as well. They don't talk about it too much. But the, uh, the whole world was in turmoil, absolutely. And, uh, and it was a do or die. And we went in to Europe and fought along with our allies in Europe and the French and the, Ger and the Russians were somewhat of an ally, not really, but the British were our big allies over there. And, and really our participation saved, saved Europe, the way I see it. And, uh, <clears throat> And it's so interesting nowadays to see the attitude of the French and, mm -hmm. and, the, and the Germans uh, towards us, but uh, things change. And then we, we, we were fighting the war in the Pacific against the Japanese. And it, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of Americans were killed to save democracy and save, save our country. And uh, I, I just don't feel that the succeeding generations, and that includes my children and my grandchildren, of course, are too young, to, to understand the perilous time and the, the sacrifice that was made by everybody pulling together at that time, because the whole world was at war. And, uh, but I guess uh, maybe it's just as well to forget some of that stuff. Jack, on behalf of the Palm Springs Air Museum, we want you to know we're proud of you. <laughs> and we thank you for your service. And we hope that this documentation will be enjoyed and kept with your family as it will be in the Congress of the United States. Well, well, Staff Sergeant Tull, thank you. Well, Don, that's very nice. and I. I, I, it was a great experience, and it, it was uh, interesting, good and bad. But uh, I, I appreciate spending the time and your, your interest in doing this with me. Thanks so much, too.